Today on Vital Insights. During COVID, they came to us and said, Wi-Fi is not cutting it to monitor people at home. We don't want to have to bring them in. We need to close the connectivity gap. And so we need to jump over the need of Wi-Fi and we need to have cellular. And so we went to work with the federal government and got RPM approved. Welcome to an episode of Vital Insights, a podcast series focused on thought leaders and healthcare providers who are working to transform the way we care for patients now and in the future. A few weeks ago, we had the pleasure of speaking with AT&T's Joe Dragas on our show, and we focused the conversation on how AT&T is enabling the care of the future. Our next guest is also one of AT&T's healthcare technology warriors, and we're going to take an even deeper dive into how that future is going to be enabled through 5G, edge processing, and the Internet of Medical Things, or IOMT. Our guest today is Clint Setti the Global Director of Strategy and Innovation for AT&T. In his current role, he's dedicated to AT&T's healthcare vertical for national and global accounts. So I really want to welcome you to Vital Insights. Thanks for having me, Liz. Absolutely. And the first question that I'm going to pose for you is one I also asked Joe, so no pressure. Right. Um, But I'd love to get your take on it as well. So people tend to associate AT&T with phone lines. And by people, I mean, of course, you know, my mother my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you tell us a little about the move into healthcare and why it's an important one for the company as a whole? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think this is our second real attempt at at healthcare and we got lessons learned from our first round about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, we, We got into it, but I don't think we waited to really listen to healthcare and to understand exactly what healthcare wanted us to help them with. We just created some solutions, went out there and said, hey, here it is. And it kind of muddied the waters of what our core strengths were, were secure, reliable, um, you know, everywhere connectivity uh, across a methodology or a, a plethora of fiber and mobility and things like that. And now what we're doing is we're starting off in leveraging those core strengths but we're partnering more strategically as healthcare kind of drives us into what partnerships they want us to have. Things like VR, uh, you know, virtual reality content, things like that, which we got to do some of because we have Time Warner, right? Um, so that was really fun. Um, so I think we're better at how we listen to healthcare and how we push forward to improve outcomes utilizing our core strengths first, and we partner where we're organically directed to by healthcare. Give me an example of that. Yeah. So uh, when we first launched um, some some connected medical devices, uh, like glucometers and things like that, we didn't really understand that there's a whole other ecosystem of care around the person that utilizes that. And so you really need to have a good turnkey solution that includes their clinician's ability to reach out to them uh, in a rich way, have devices configured specifically for them, already have them leveraged. And our first one, we literally had an AT&T glucometer. Well, nobody needs to see AT&T's name (laughs) on the medical device, right? They need to trust the connectivity. And so with our virtual care platform, we partnered with the healthcare industry said, these are some of the platforms based on how we're going to use virtual care that we want you to, to use. And even including the federal government's first net program for connectivity, because cellular has become an equity gap closer for us. So where people can, you cannot assume that someone has internet at their home in their rural areas or in urban underserved areas. I mean, I have socioeconomic versus geographic barriers. And so bringing cellular and connectivity with the device actually closes that gap and i think that the billing codes that are all all, that are automated now with the platform really allow people to not have to think about well how do i get reimbursed for the connectivity how do i get reimbursed for the time in it so really partnering strategically was one of the ways that we listened to healthcare, and especially in virtual care. And we got that um, approved for the federal government's first net program because it's a first responder network. Yeah. But in the end, what healthcare said is virtual monitoring, especially of chronics, is a first responder avoidance solution, meaning that instead of having that ambulance go out there to pick up the patient that was two days out of surgery and now they're at home you know re- relaxing and trying they suddenly say hey I- i'm getting dizzy i want to come into the hospital turns out they just weren't drinking water they were dehydrated right. well if we had had virtual care we could have talked to them and, and handled that 
And so um, it lowers costs, it improves care, and uh, but it closes the equity gap a lot. And pharma is the same way with clinical trials. They're trying to close the gap on equity representation of data in those same groups, which are extremely costly. So that's where we really listened of how do we pick the right connectivity for healthcare in these different spots and leverage it to improve the metrics that healthcare is targeted as opposed to us just coming out there and saying, here's a bunch of stuff, see if it works and you guys yeah, try it. Yeah. So we've, we've seen a lot like of it. folks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. We're just crossing <laughs> our fingers. And now we're like, no, we know you're going to like it. We know that we this is what you guys um, kind of asked for. And during COVID, they came to us and said, Wi-Fi is not cutting it to monitor people at home. We don't want to have to bring them in. We need to close the connectivity gap. And so we need to jump over the need of Wi-Fi and we need to have cellular. And so we went to work with the federal government and got RPM approved for that particular network. And because it's a separate core and separate network, it's not a different flavor of AT&T. It's its own separate network. And so um, we Wall Street would have literally shot us in the street if we tried to um, justify putting a tower down a dirt road with two farms on it. Right. The federal government says that's important to our community. It's important to the first responders' ability because that's infrastructure that we rely on. And our first responders need to have that support, including health care. And the healthier population is, the better that labor uh, is targeted for improvement and development and attracts business. So cellular actually going in first as an infrastructure creator, but also an industry developer and enabler from that standpoint. That's fantastic. There is so much that I want to unpack there. <laughs> but I did promise people we would talk about 5G. So I want to, I want to delve into that a little bit. So some people um, say 5G represents a kind of beacon of data transfer potential, right? Others have called it more of like a meh stepping stone like meh right yeah what do you think i have spent a ton of time educating people that thought they knew 5g oh please bring it bring it they 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 saw the hype they're like oh it can't go through a wall it can't, but they don't realize there's actually three different tiers within the 5g standard there's low there's mid there's high um, that towers are going to deliver the, that mid band hospitals inside their cellular networks their fabrics inside the hospital will also use mid band and then they will position the high band millimeter wave that has line of sight necess uh, uh, needs um, where it's strategically needed like in the imaging center in the physical therapy center and funny enough in the clinician's lounge because they're all relaxing suddenly they're getting big images sent to them right right but at the same time, they don't realize that the bulk of the use cases are not really about bandwidth, but they're about the ultra low latency. And the fact that we can now reimagine what's possible and we have to redefine the tools of care, to be honest. So things like video as a sensor to monitor the virtual guardrails of, of your bedroom, um, so whether you're at home or in the hospital, so you don't fall out of bed, so that they can detect something that was not being detected before based on your body movements and be more predictive. Um, you know, the ability to leverage, by the way, one of the ones that we use right now, video as a sensor um, with a company, um, they can tell you whether or not the room's dirty. Oh, wow. Um, they can actually look at a lot and they do some really neat things with AI and then they provide the dashboard and the alerting back to the nurse's station. But the ultra low latency has so much more potential even to take rendering off of extended reality glasses and allow for dynamic environments that are endless so that you can use them with, as the FDA is continuing to learn more about this uh, to create pain attenuation effects um, too, so that you don't have to have as much anesthesia, especially when you talk about the opioid epidemic and, and the needs of that particular demographic. Um, doing it for physical therapy, distraction, uh, so many things. When you take the rendering off of the glasses, you have to have 5G in the middle. Wi-Fi as a standard, even the latest stuff, is not capable of hitting the five millisecond and the sub one millisecond direction that we're heading. So split rendering of extended reality is going to redefine the tools of care just in that technology alone. Oh my, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm dreaming of all sorts of things now. So you touched a little bit on the provider standpoint there. Could mm -hmm. you touch on the patient standpoint? Yeah. Like, so what does life look like with 5G? So, well, now, you know, for, when we first started this, we were really working with the hospitals to allow the patients to move their medical devices from the hospital to the home. And that's one of the reasons why we created these private licensed cellular networks inside the hospital so that that device can work inside that hospital with no data plan, have access to edge compute and things like that, but then move to that patient's home for hospital at home and things like that. 
what we're going to see going forward is a, a some diagnostic awareness that may happen without you ever coming into the hospital, a deployment and delivery of those medical assets, and only if your trajectory is detrimental to you that you may have to come into the hospital. So before we went from the hospital out, and then I think over time we're going to see care starting outside the hospital and then coming in. Um, I just think that because of 5G, you're going to be able to have a densification of those types of devices and you're going to have an ultra low latency, which will allow the medical devices for the patient to cost less because you don't need as much compute right, on the endpoint. Right. And that closes the equity gap and cost of care as well, which is something we've all been trying to solve. Absolutely. Um, so it, there's a lot of things about 5G people just don't understand. And the minute I walk out of a meeting, they look at me and say, hey, I want to start the use case brainstorming session. This is I, there, there are things that we want to do. Nurses carts, you're right. They keep reboot, rebooting. Let's just <laughs> let's just plug a cradle point into one, get it on the on the on the private cellular inside the building, and then let's start doing stuff from there. Doctors do not like doing voice dictation over Wi-Fi. It locks up. Um, they they like to walk around. They like to pace. Well, cellular allows them to do that versus Wi-Fi locks up those sessions. So there are low hanging fruit stuff that you can do today. But then there is a, an explosion of what the future looks like, especially with extended reality and video. 85% of our network today at at t is video. And when you talk about the difference between telehealth video and Netflix, network slicing in 5G is going to be how we end up differentiating between those two things and creating service fabrics geared towards specific industries like healthcare. So it'll be interesting how care anywhere and the nomadic nature of it um, will be provided for, but we're going to see a device explosion. So it's going to be interesting with 5G. I love that. I love that vision. Um, and that was a nice segue actually into my next question, which is if we imagine a future where, where patient care simply becomes living. Mm -hmm. So we started off talking about this, right? right yeah. In other words, it happens in people's homes and is simply kind of part of the backdrop of life, fades into the fabric of what you do every day. Um, what technology support do you see as necessary for achieving that? Yeah, you, you, we really need to use all the levels of things like 5G, the low band to, to go everywhere, uh, battery optimization so that everything can have you know connectivity. Um, but at the same time, when everything's connected, that's a lot of data getting ingested and being able to process that at the edge and let it, that processing move about the way you move about. If I start off in Atlanta and I fly to Los Angeles, the network needs to be aware that my compute of my constant monitoring, that compute needs to move with me in the network as well. So a constant feed of data will bring healthcare a contextual picture of how you're living, which directs how you're cared for. And I think that's what's going to really improve healthcare is to you are being made aware through the connectivity of how you live, work, and play, but now healthcare can take advantage of how the knowledge of how you live, work, and play. And so connectivity has to be everywhere. I think the carriers are doing a pretty good job at trying to reutilize spectrum, buy more of it, utilize all the different layers of 5G and things like that. So I think that care will be everywhere, but we will live in a mode of care in, in, in points of of influence at, at different points of our lives about, hey, exercise or stand up or, um, you know, order some, you might want to order something different or, hey, go easy on the salt. And then other times it's going to be very focused in how healthcare is applied because it may see something that we don't see. And those will be the advantages of AI, um, being able to see those things that are beyond our current correlations. So. So when you talk about this with people, how do you handle the inevitable privacy question that comes up? Yeah, and so that is one of those points where we say, you can determine how much data you feed piece. into it. Yep. And if you know that sometimes the more I put in, maybe the, the more awareness healthcare has to give me a better diagnostic when something does happen, other times it's like, hey, I'm going to give you some. I'm going to get 80% of the way there. I'm going to take a chance on the 20 because I just I want the privacy. So you can decide when it turns on and turns off. But you're also aware of what that means in terms of your care and the quality of it. But I think that will become much narrower over time. But it's, it's a freedom of data and an opt-in, uh, but with an understanding of what that means for your care. I mean, I see it as empowerment. Mm -hmm. But my mom will say... 
but is it watching me all the time? You know, and yeah, I'm like, no, 1984 smart I know. <laughs> did a number on that entire generation. So many people, yes. And yes. the new generations, they don't know what privacy is. They've never had privacy, oh, no. right? So, no, my son doesn't care. Right, <laughs> right, right. And so I think we're all grappling now with, you know, what does it mean um, that when we're responsible for it? And do we also accept the consequences of it? And so we have to understand where it's meaningful to share data and where maybe you want to pull back a little bit and not share data, but it'll be up to us. Yeah. Um, but the understanding that it does affect how you live, work and play and your care goes along with that. Yes, it does. And yes, it does. <laughs> um, so shifting gears a little bit, but not really. Talk about IOMT. Oh yeah. Because I did tease this up at the beginning of this. So as, a, as kind of a champion of it, how do you differentiate between that and IOT? So IOMT, uh, Internet of Medical Things, is a, you know really a subset of IoT, right? Yeah. So anytime you have something that is generating diagnostic data or it's providing a medical intervention, um, a mode of care, if you will, those things to me bring a, a, you know, a differentiation. So I can measure the temperature of your hospital room or I can measure the temperature of your body. One is creating PHI, clinical data, diagnostic data, and the other one is just a facilities and environmental um, that's not necessarily generating that particular data. So it's a difference between generating diagnostic data that's used in your care, yeah. as well as is it creating a medical intervention. And, and by the way, we're going to see software classified as an Internet of Medical Thing, um, you know, software as a medical device. Um, I sit on the Medical Device uh, Innovation Consortium and we're writing the library out now to help the FDA and the USDA figure out what does the framework look like of freezing an algorithm that's a software medical device and allowing that to be used. And then when that's updated, how quickly can the FDA analyze that and then reapprove it to be deployed for an improvement? Right. Well, there's going to have to be some automation. The wheels of government don't move as fast. But because everything's in software, the speed of change is going to be very low cost and it's going to be very ridiculous in how fast it happens. But the speed at which regulations approve those things has to change. So that's what we're working now is how do we do that? Do we use some AI to analyze those things? Can, you know, what, what do we do? Um, because if you know that you can change the algorithm and improve an outcome, you're desperate to get that change made. Oh, yeah, so. absolutely. So... I'll be curious to see where you go with this one, mm -hmm. but um, where do you see the convergence of technology and healthcare having the most impact? Yeah. You're going to have to limit yourself on this one because I know you can yeah. go in like 12 different directions. Well, I, I'll give them the one that would abso does absolutely scare uh, the, the older generations, especially, and even some in my own generation. And that is um, the FDA has already started certifying some of the AI to provide longer trending diagnostic um, opinions, right? So we have to get through that the idea of a digital second opinion um, will be there, but also AI doing a medical intervention, recalibrating a ventilator um, to avoid asynchrony uh, in, in real time. Well, normally a nurse comes over and, and they recalibrate that. Now you've got software recalibrating that, which means it did it based on a trigger of contextual knowledge has been correlated through machine learning We've got to figure out how to make that really reliable, but it's worth the journey. Oh, yeah. Because the impact, you know, on a ventilator with asynchrony, when AI was able to adjust it, you can go from what asynchrony would have caused a 25 day on a ventilator to become a seven day stay on a ventilator, and you reduce the chances of damaging your lungs. Um, so when you talk about the, the harvest, if you will, the value, of AI and healthcare coming together at these different layers of digital opinion, diagnostic trending, and then medical intervention. It's a great journey that's going to give us a lot of learnings, but when they come together, healthcare is just going to be amazing. And I don't know what that's mean, going to mean for my life. I know my wife doesn't want me to live to be 150, um, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, you know, AI is going to make our lives better quality because we can work, live, and play everywhere in a connected world. Yeah. Okay, so you basically answered my last question, but dream a little bit with me. What do you see as kind of the future future of patient care? Like, what does it what does it look like? 
Paint yeah, the picture. I mean, really, it's it's things like extended reality volumetric capture calling, where you see your doctor appear in your room wherever you are, to have that rich collaborative conversation is um, about your care. Um, it is the ability to leverage those same tools to create. Um, you know, chronic pain attenuation that can be, you know, that can be alleviated through those kinds of things. The ability to, um, you know, provide some uh, symptom mitigation that pharmaceuticals are looking for and these digital therapies, all from the same technology, the same set of glasses, allow me to talk to my caretaker, to, you know, work through the physical therapy, get rid of my pain. And that's just one technology. Yeah. So the network is being built out and invested in to create these points of, you know, cloud providers having these landing zones to breathe in and out of our lives, the compute that will allow us to make better decisions, but have richer interactions with our care. And I think that's what it's going to come down to is you're always a patient. You're always in a constant mode of care. Which kind of means you're also by proxy, never a patient. That's right. Before I came here, I was actually thinking we've got to get rid of that word. And we do, because no one ever wants to yeah, be a patient. A patient means you've crossed some threshold. Yeah. And suddenly it also has a psychological impact. And now it should be that I'm always receiving care. Yes. And it's just part of life. Yeah, exactly. I love that. That's a fantastic vision. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it.